Lord, you said because of the mercies of Christ that have been shown us that we are to present ourselves to you as a living and as a holy sacrifice. You admonished us not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed through the renewing of our minds. That was what we just sang to you, Father, that you would renew our minds, that we might even know and prove and test and exemplify that your will is indeed good and holy and perfect. Thank you that your will is found in your word. Thank you for your word. You said it is a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. And thank you that you've given the Holy Spirit to help us when we're lost, to convict us and to show us our need. And when we are born again, to teach us and to lead us and to guide us into all the truth. And we pray today for his ministry that it would be real. Come, Father, and fill me with his presence and speak through me and anoint me that the one who came to glorify Jesus might indeed glorify him today. And I ask it, Lord Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. Would you take God's word this morning and turn to the last book of the Bible, to the very last chapter in the Bible, Revelation chapter 22. If this is your first Sunday, we have been working our way chapter by chapter and verse by verse through the revelation of Christ that was given to the Apostle John. And as you're finding our passage, may I just say that some of the issues that are addressed in our text this morning are difficult. It would be easy for myself or really any preacher to talk himself out of preaching this message. This morning's text is not one of those happy messages. I'd much rather preach about joy or victory or the abundant life, and all those need to be preached. But we as pastors are to preach the whole counsel of God, and I'm convinced that a missing message in most churches is what I've titled this sermon, What Happens When Jesus Returns? And we want to address it from our passage because it speaks to what happens to both the believer and to the unbeliever. And I believe that one of the reasons there is so much apathy today in evangelical churches is that the average Christian knows he's saved and he's going to heaven. But what he doesn't really understand is that there is an accountability when he gets to heaven that he will have to give to Jesus. And one of the reasons there's so much hell in the world today is because there's so little of it in the pulpits. And so God's word is to be taught, not just that he is a God of love, but he is a God of wrath. And our message sounds the alarm for both the saved and the lost. One of the great motivations to share your faith, Paul said, for the love of Christ compels us, it controls us, it constrains us. But he also said, therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But sadly, again, many Christians today take pleasure and comfort in the fact that they are saved. And what they don't understand are the implications on how they serve once they're saved, what those implications will be when they get to heaven. And so a faithful preacher is to teach the whole counsel of God, and that certainly includes repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus. When Paul came to the end of his life, he said, I finished the course in my ministry, and he had finished it well. And I want to finish well, and I want each of us to finish well. And our passage will help us to see how we can do that. Revelation chapter 22. Many come every week for the first time. You've never needed to bring a Bible to church, and I get that. You need one here. It will be really helpful to you to have one. You'll get 50% more out of any sermon if you have a Bible in your lap. And if you don't have one, you come tonight at 530, and you'll get a nice Bible. Revelation 22, beginning in verse 10. And he said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong, and the one who is filthy still be filthy, and let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. Now remember, the chapter and verse divisions are artificial. And they can be distracting at times if you fail to see the flow of the narrative. When we came to verse 6 of this chapter, the tour of heaven that had started back in Revelation 21, 9, 
that went through chapter 22 and verse 5 has ended. So when you come to verse 6 of chapter 22, you've entered into the epilogue of the book. It's the other bookend on the Revelation. We saw the first bookend in chapter 1 in the prologue that John gave, and now the final bookend of John's vision, and really not just to the Revelation, but in one sense to the whole of Scripture, since this is the final words that God gave us. And we have here some words that are spoken by an angel, by the Apostle John, and by the Lord Jesus himself. And this exchange takes place between one of these angels who we saw holds one of the seven bowls of the wrath of God and this final conversation as well that the Lord Jesus has with his beloved disciple named John. And as we read these verses, we're struck with the truth that all that John saw, each and every vision that John is given, all that he records is given to us so that we will respond. God didn't give you the revelation so you can make some prophecy chart. He gave you the revelation not to make us smarter sinners, but to make us, once we are saved, more like the Lord Jesus. And there are two responses that John underscores in our verses. There's a note-taking outline if you're new. There's a pen in the seat back pocket. First, I want us to see that Christ's return will settle who we will be. A day is coming when Jesus will come back, and when he returns, it will settle who we will be. Look again in verse 10. And he said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Now, John is commanded not to seal up this book, but he is to write it down so that you can read it, so that you can study it. And that's consistent with what we studied in Revelation 1.11, where John hears this loud voice from the throne of God that says, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches. And I find it interesting that what John is told to do is the exact opposite of what the prophet Daniel is called to do concerning his prophecy. John is told not to seal up the words of this prophecy, while Daniel is commanded to conceal, to seal up his prophecy. So to understand really much of what John is saying, we have to go back to Daniel. So take your Bible and turn to the book of Daniel. If you're new, Psalms are about dead center in your Bible, and scan to the right and you will soon come to the book of Daniel. We studied Daniel before we did Revelation because they fit together like a hand in a glove. Daniel gives you the schematic for the whole book of Revelation. Go to Daniel chapter 12, and we want to focus on verse 4 of that chapter. But to understand verse 4, we need to understand its context. So we're going to start in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. All right, it sounds like you have it. Follow along. Look at verse 1 of Daniel 12. Now, at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. Michael, the great archangel, is pictured throughout the Bible as the protector of Israel. And Michael is mentioned four times in the Scripture, and each time this archangel is mentioned, he is having some kind of an encounter, some kind of a battle with Satan himself. And so we're told here that Michael is the one who stands guard over the sons of your people. Now, since Daniel is a Jew, we can conclude that the sons of your people is a reference to the Hebrew people. Michael the archangel is guarding the nation of Israel, and a day is coming when he will arise. Now, we're not told specifically by the prophet Daniel what he's going to stand up and do. But God, if you remember, gave us divine commentary on this verse back in Revelation chapter 12. Let me just read that verse to you. Don't leave Daniel. And there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. And we studied that war in detail. During the time of the great tribulation, there's going to be a war in heaven, a war between God's holy angels led by Michael against God's demons led by Satan, who is called the dragon. And the war will result literally in Satan and all of his fallen demons moving from the realm of the heavenly places where they will literally be physically on the earth. It's going to happen during the second half of the tribulation period. 
So with that in mind, let me read Daniel 12, 1 again. Now at that time, Michael, the great prince, who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise, and there will be a time of distress such as has never occurred since there was a nation until that time. Now the specificity of that time is given through other scripture. Here's a chart just to refresh your memory. As you can see, right in the middle of this seven-year period called the time of Jacob's trouble, we call it often the Great Tribulation, though the second half is specifically greater in its force. But right in the middle of this seven-year period that Daniel spoke of in the ninth chapter, that the revelation as well divides into two halves, there's two key events that happen. One is called the abomination of desolation, and the other is this war in heaven that we just mentioned. The abomination of desolation is when the Antichrist goes into the temple of God and he says that he is God in human flesh. Now, if Jesus went into the temple of God and said he was God in human flesh, it would be totally appropriate because he is God in human flesh. But there is one who is coming who is going to mimic the Lord Jesus, who will come in the place of the Lord Jesus, who will claim to be God, and the Jews will know it is impossible that he could indeed be the Messiah because with that event, he will commit an act of idolatry and God's revelation would not contradict itself. There is a statue in the temple that will literally, physically, actually speak. And when this event happens right in the middle, literally, tribulation like the world has never seen is going to unfold. Jesus describing it, he said, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And many believers will die during this period of time, but many of the Jews who are going to be pouring over the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and 25 will heed Christ's advice. How do I know? Because Revelation 12 tells us they will flee into the wilderness, and God will supernaturally protect them. And so what I've just described here for you takes place when Michael the archangel stands up, the abomination of desolation is happening on the earth, and in heaven there's a war. And when that event happens, the trumpet and bold judgments will unfold. Remember, we studied that. When they begin to unfold, there's 30 minutes of silence in heaven. Just before the first trumpet sounds, People are able to see in the trumpets and in the bowls all the judgments that are going to come. Unlike the seven seal judgments, they were unwrapped one at a time. But in the seven trumpets, you will have the seven bowls. And when they see what is about to follow in the next three and a half years, it just takes their breath away. There's silence in heaven. And so, reading further into Daniel 12 and verse 1, and there will be a time of distress, such as has never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. This will be an unprecedented time in Israel's history and really in world history. Uh, this is a time that Moses spoke of all the way back in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Let me read to you Deuteronomy 4 and verse 30. When you are in distress, and all these things have come upon you in the latter days. Moses uses this term like the Old Testament prophets to describe that time right before Messiah rules and reigns and establishes his kingdom on the earth. In the latter times, you will return to the Lord your God and listen to his voice. So he's speaking of these latter days, this great time of distress, and God is going to use it to turn the Jewish people, who for the most part are in total unbelief today concerning Jesus, they're going to believe in Jesus. Jeremiah said it this way in Jeremiah 30 and verse 7, Alas, for that day, this tribulation day, is great. There is none like it. And it is the time of Jacob's distress or trouble, but he will be saved from it. Listen to how the prophet Joel describes this time frame. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As the dawn is spread over the mountains, so there is a great and mighty people. There has never been anything like it, nor will there ever be again after it. And so concurrent with what God the Father 
revealed in the Old Testament, God the Son consistently says in Matthew 24, 21, for then there will be a great tribulation. When the abomination of desolation takes place, he said, for then there will be great tribulation. It goes from tribulation to great tribulation. Such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. So Matthew 24 is a virtual quote from Daniel 12.1. And there will be a time of distress such as has never occurred since there was a nation until that time. Jesus, speaking of this unprecedented time, said this, And if those days had not been cut short, no one would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will cut short. No one would physically be able to survive to be saved during this seven-year period had not God at some point put an end to it. And so Daniel speaks of those who will survive the tribulation here. And he said, and at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. Now, the book that he is speaking of is mentioned throughout the Old and New Testaments. We often refer to it as the book of life or the Lamb's book of life. And in the book of life are the names of everyone who looks to God and the salvation that he has provided through the Lord Jesus. Now, if you put Daniel's statement together with other New Testament passages, we learn that when Jesus comes back, those who get saved during the Great Tribulation, those who survive will enter the coming kingdom. They will be saved for the kingdom. And we will see in a moment those who die, they will be raised. And when they are raised, tribulation saints, so won't Old Testament saints be raised. Paul described that when the Lord comes back, it's going to be a time of great blessing, but it is also going to be a time of great horror. Listen to what he said in 2 Thessalonians 1. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, this is the visible return of Christ to the earth, what we call the second coming, What's he going to do? He's going to be dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among the, all who have believed in our testimony to you was believed. So this time, just like Daniel says, for some will be a time of great blessing, but for other people, a time of great horror. Let's read verse 2. Again, as we set the context, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Daniel is describing that both believers and unbelievers who have died will be raised up from the dead. Now, he's not dealing so much with the timing of the event as he is dealing with the kind of resurrection. Just like Jesus in John 5, he says, an hour is coming when all will hear the voice of the Son of Man. Some will come to a resurrection of life, others to a resurrection of judgment. But God begins to unfold how the whole resurrection program will take place. But here when he speaks of those who are asleep in the dust of the ground, just like in the New Testament, he's not describing the state of your soul your mind, your will, and emotions, or your spirit, the immaterial portion of man. Man is three parts. Paul says he's made up of body, soul, and spirit. He's describing your physical body. Your physical body is in the dust of the ground. And Daniel is speaking of his people, Israel. All those saints who are asleep in the dust of the ground, not to mention unbelieving Jews and Gentiles who are asleep in the dust of the ground. And he says, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Now, if you've been with us in our study of the, of the Revelation, we've learned that there's a resurrection program. One program is called the first resurrection. The other is, describes the final resurrection that the scripture calls the second death. If you remember in the first resurrection program, as this chart reminds us, first, of course, the Lord Jesus is raised from the dead. He's the first one ever in all of human time to be resurrected. There were some people whom he raised from the dead. Elijah raised one. Elisha raised one. Paul raised one. Uh, Peter raised one. One guy fell on a prophet's bones and he was raised. But only Jesus 
is the first to be resurrected from the dead. And immediately after his resurrection, the first resurrection program unfolds. As Matthew 27, 52, and 53 tells us, there's a handful of Old Testament saints after Jesus is raised who are in turn also resurrected. And this is in keeping with a prophecy, with a feast that God gave, the Feast of First Fruits, where a single stalk is presented to the priest representative of Messiah, who's the first to be raised, and then a handful. And there's a handful of Old Testament saints. The resurrection program will continue at the rapture. That's stage two. And so 1 Thessalonians 4 says, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel. And the dead in Christ will come out of the grave first. He'll bring back with him Paul says, those who have fallen asleep, he'll bring their spirits back from heaven because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord and he'll reconnect the person inside, the real you, with the body that's asleep in the dust of the ground. But stage three is seven plus years later when all the resurrection and tribulation saints are raised. So all the Old Testament saints... They're raised up at the end of the tribulation, along with all those people who find Jesus during this seven-year period, people who have never heard the gospel before. And Revelation 20 and verse 4 says, they are raised up, people who are beheaded for their faith. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. So here, Jews and Gentiles alike who die in the time of distress, they will be raised up during this time. Now, Daniel does not give us, again, the timing of all of the resurrections, but he's basically saying when you take all the air out of the balloon, there's two kinds. A resurrection of great blessing, everlasting contempt for the rest. And, of course, those two resurrection programs we've already learned is separated by a 1,000 years. And so in Revelation 20, in verse 5, we're told the rest of the dead did not come to life until the 1,000 years were completed. Verse 4, this is the first resurrection, but the rest of the dead, they don't come to life until the 1,000 years are completed. And then the lost of all time are raised up to be judged. So the rest of the dead is in this second group, and they will meet disgrace in everlasting contempt. Now look at verse 3. My point that I want to make concerning Revelation 22 is uh, related to verse 4, but we've got to set the context, so be patient. Look at verse 3. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven, and those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So Daniel addresses now two groups of believers who are rewarded for their faithfulness during this horrible time that's called the time of Jacob's trouble or the great tribulation period. He speaks first of those who have insight. And he says they will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. And this is a reference to those who faithfully teach and practice and live out the Bible, the Word of God. And Daniel, the prophet, uses this phrase on two occasions to describe those who are faithful to the Word of God. That's how he defines this phrase, those who have insight. In Daniel eleven thirty three, he says, those who have insight among the people will give understanding to the many. And let me say, while Daniel is speaking about his people, Jews, during the tribulation, who have understanding, who will faithfully preach the Word of God, by application, the rest of the New Testament applies this today to any believer in the church age. And so a dad who sits around his table in the evening and he isn't teaching and instructing his kids the Scripture or as he works with his child and he says, you know, we're to do our work, son, as unto the Lord. And you want to do this job, Paul said, like you were serving the Lord Jesus because someday he'll evaluate your work as a believer in Jesus. A mom who is in the home and raising her children, and as she walks in the way, as she rises up, as she lays down, she's teaching her children the Scripture. You could apply this to someone who works with our children in Sunday school or upward sports or Awana or in an adult Bible fellowship. It's the Great Commission. Do you remember what Jesus said? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Make disciples. He doesn't say do discipleship. 
This verse for the last 50 years has been an escape clause for many who want to lead Bible studies but not really faithfully share their faith. He's talking contextually about the believer who faithfully, whatever his gifts may be, they do the work of an evangelist. They make disciples. They make converts of all nations. What do you do with new believers? You baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's why in the parallel account, Jesus says, believe and then be baptized. Baptism always follows your becoming a believer, a disciple. And then what do you do? You teach them to observe all that I commanded you. So this is a command that Christ gives to the whole church because it's a promise attached to it that he'll be with us all the way to the end of the age. And so those who faithfully teach by word and by deed God's word are going to receive a reward. But then Daniel mentions in the second half of verse 3 another basis in which God will hand out rewards to faithful. Notice, and and those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. These are people who attempt to share the good news, who attempt to win people to Christ. Now, some of you will sow seed, but the fact that you're sowing seed, God uses his seed. Now, if you sow just a little seed out in your lawn this week, you'll just get a few sprouts of grass. But if you sow a lot of seed, a lot of grass will catch. And if you sow a lot of evangelistic seed, you'll see sooner or later some people that will come to Christ. You'll either see them come to Christ through the seed that you've planted, or you might even harvest the seed. And with all my heart, I believe that if you faithfully Month after month, year after year, share your faith. You will eventually see someone through your personal witness bow their head and receive Jesus as Lord. And so in both these groups, those who teach and those who win people to Christ, notice they're compared to the expanse and the stars. They will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven and those who lead the many to righteousness. The brightness of the sky above, the stars, They're often depicted in Scripture of someone who is rewarded with a high position, who is given greater responsibility. And we learned already that during the reign of the Messiah, when he reigns on the earth for a thousand years, not to mention in the eternal state, there will be degrees of reward. Uh, This is, by the way, if you've not taken the discovery class, this might be worth considering. It's topic number seven in the discovery class. Uh, They spend three weeks on it, and it deals with the rewards that believers get when they get to heaven. And they are described in terms of crowns, but let me at least briefly touch on them. There's what the Bible calls the imperishable crown, and this is the person, the believer, who is willing to consistently to die to self, to sinful nature, and God will reward him for that. Then there's the crown of rejoicing. I've dubbed it here the evangelistic crown. And Daniel is mentioning this here in Daniel 12 of those people who faithfully share their faith. God will reward them for that. And wouldn't you expect it? If the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost, he will reward and honor the person who's doing what he's come to do. Then there's what the Bible calls the crown of life. James, the apostle, addresses this crown. And it's the person who faithfully perseveres through trials. Then there's what we call the crown of righteousness, or I've called it here the expecting crown. And it's the person who is rewarded because he is longing, he is expecting the return of Jesus from heaven. Do you know that God rewards you if you are longing for Christ's return? You say, why would he do that? It's obvious. Paul says all that look for his return, purify themselves as he is pure, John teaches the same thing. Then there's the crown of glory. What's the crown of glory? It's the shepherd's crown in 1 Peter 5. The pastor who faithfully teaches God's word. And by extension, the Christian, since we are all given that responsibility in Hebrews 5, who also faithfully teaches what he is learning. And these crowns, as we studied in Revelation 4, aren't going to be worn on our heads. The elders take those crowns and they cast them at the feet of the Lord Jesus. And so those who have insight, we might call these wise people, those who have insight will shine brightly. 
Those who have insight in that they are taking the word of God and as God gives them ministry, they share it with people. Not to mention they share the gospel with the unbeliever. Solomon says, the one who is wise wins souls. You know, when I need advice from someone, among other things I look for, is someone who's attempting to win people to Jesus because it tells me they're wise. It's well been said that if you want to plant something that will last for a year, then plant a flower. If you want to plant something that will, that will last for a lifetime, potentially plant a tree. But if you want to plant, plant something that will last forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, then plant the gospel seed in someone's heart Those who lead the many to righteousness will shine, he says, like the stars forever and ever. Now we come to the verse that I wanted to get to, and it's essential that we understand this verse because it will help us to understand why John is given the opposite advice. John is told, we just read it in Revelation 22.10, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. We're here in Daniel 12 and verse 4. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up this book until the time of the end. Then he says, many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. So Daniel is told to conceal the words, to seal up the book for the principal reason that these words have as their primary application a future time called the time of the end. Now, the sealing does not mean that these truths are hidden, but simply that they are later revealed in terms of their fullest meaning. However, it also needs to remind us that there's probably a lot more that Daniel was given that he never wrote down. But there's going to come a time when people are going to read and study the book of Daniel like they have never read or studied it. And he associates this time of study with the time of the end. Again, the great tribulation period. The book of Daniel will be read and studied all over again. Now, the modern critics for years said that Daniel was so specific in its prophecies that it was a second century A.D. I mean, Daniel 9 predicts the year the Messiah is going to come to the earth and present himself to the Jewish people as their Messiah. The day, actually. It makes all kinds of prophecies that will take place in the 400-year intertestament period. And so the critics say, well, this was a second century A.D. book. Ah, the Dead Sea Scrolls crushed that argument. Because while the Dead Sea Scrolls gave us a copy of the Old Testament book of Daniel that was a thousand years older than the previous copies we had, still a lot of the prophecies that are found in Daniel take place during the intertestament period. And that even if someone dated the Dead Sea Scroll at 250 BC, many prophecies happen between that time frame and the time Jesus steps on the planet. It's an incredible, incredible book. So the close of verse 4, which sadly has been misinterpreted in a number of ways, is key to understanding the first half of verse 4. Let's look at it. He said, many will go back and forth, and knowledge will increase. And so some have said that this many will go back and forth refers to increased travel at the end of time in modern days. And so it's colorfully preached. You know, Daniel walked, or he went on the speed of horseback, and he communicated by a foot messenger, where today we travel even potentially at the speed of sound, and we can send messages at the speed of light. And so some will preach, and knowledge will increase in terms of our ability to have knowledge at our fingertips, like the internet. And I could ride that horse and make it really colorful and try to impress you, but it's just not true. It's not true. Because the best interpreter of Scripture is Scripture itself. And we are not to be dramatic in our teaching where we ignore the context nor the rest of Scripture that God has given. The Hebrew words translated to go to to and fro or to go back and forth or here and there or dash about depending on which English translations you are reading is used in the Old Testament of someone who is searching, not someone who's traveling. 
For instance, the chronicler writes in 2 Chronicles 16, For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. Same Hebrew words. Jeremiah uses the same Hebrew words in the fifth chapter that he wrote. Roam to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem and look now and take note and seek in her open squares if you can find a man, if there is one who does justice, who seeks truth. Likewise, the prophet Amos records in the eighth chapter, people will stagger from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. They will go to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. Likewise, the prophet Zechariah, using the same Hebrew phrase, says in the fourth chapter, these are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro throughout the earth. So in each of these same verses, it's the Hebrew word short, and it refers to someone who's searching, someone who is looking, and the knowledge that they are going to desperately run back and forth, to and fro for, concerns answers that are found in God's word. When this awful, unbelievable time begins to happen in human history, when there are famines and earthquakes and natural disasters and demonic activity on the earth and bloodshed like the world has never seen, people will look for answers and some will go to and fro looking for knowledge found in the book of Daniel. And it will happen at the end of time. Now, most people today don't have a clue as to what the prophet Daniel is even about. They might possibly know the story of the three Hebrew men in the fiery furnace. Maybe they know the historical record as well of Daniel and the lion's den. But beyond that, most of what Daniel writes about, people don't have any idea about. And so Daniel, in that sense, is able to conceal up these words, this book, until the end of time, Number one, because there's coming a time when it will make a lot more sense. Uh, some of the things that even Daniel writes about are difficult for someone in his day to understand. That's not to say they're not without value, because all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable. And even someone in Daniel's day, rem remember, he's writing during the time of the Babylonian captivity. They're there in Babylon for 70 years, and when they read the prophet Daniel, among other things, they're going to be inspired to walk by faith, but they're also going to see the truth that God is not done with Israel. There's hope for the nation, and in the end, he's going to restore them from all the Gentile nations of the world. And so they'll find comfort and encouragement, but there's coming a day when the Jewish people are going to pour over the Scriptures. A minority of them are doing it today. So if you go to Jerusalem right now, this is different. When I went to Jerusalem, my first trip in 1989, there was one congregation of Messianic Jews. They numbered about 25. This morning, there are 30 congregations in Jerusalem alone of Messianic Jews. But that's just a foreshadowing of what is going to happen after the church is removed. Because the time of Jacob's trouble is designed to bring the Jewish people to the realization that Jesus is Lord. Now go back to Revelation 22 and verse 10, and we'll see why there is opposite counsel that is given. Revelation 22 and verse 10. And he said to me, this angel said to John, on God's behalf, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. Why? For the time is near. So with the opening of the church age, the future events that are unfolded in the book of Revelation could happen at any moment. Ever since the day of Pentecost, the return of Jesus has been imminent. He could return at any time. Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. And the words, tus lugus in Greek, refer to the specific words, namely the book of Revelation. Don't seal it up, John. God wants people to actually read and study the book of Revelation. It is to be expounded. It is to be proclaimed. And yet in most churches, it is never cracked. It is never taught. It is an important book. It's not the book of Revelations. There's no such book. 
It's the revelation, singular, the apocalypsis, the unveiling. God gave the book of Revelation not to conceal truth, but to reveal truth. And John is told not to seal up these words. Why? Because since Pentecost, the return of Jesus is imminent. And so unlike the prophet Daniel, who needed the church age to begin, the Messiah first needed to come. John is told, don't seal up the words, proclaim the words. And a pastor today who doesn't preach either the book of Revelation or the truths found in Revelation, found in many other places in the New Testament, a pastor who does not preach prophecy in relation to the return of Christ, number one, as we'll see in a moment, he's doing a great disservice to unbelievers because there's a time of judgment that is going to come with Christ's return. But he's also doing a great disservice to believers because believers are to be changed and motivated by the truths that are going to happen. Hell is for heaven, is forever, and, and, and heaven is forever. And so he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Now here at the end of verse 10, there's an urgency. Notice what he says, the time is near. That is, the end time events are right around the corner. You say he wrote that 2,000 years ago. Yes, he did, and it's been near ever since the ascension of Christ because there's never, ever been a single prophecy that has needed to be fulfilled for the catching up of the church. All kinds of prophecy. Israel had to be in the land. They had to be restored as a nation for the prophecies concerning the second coming to take place. Now, certainly, God could have raptured the church in 100 A.D. if he wanted, gathered the Jewish people from across the planet, brought them back into the land, and by the midpoint of the tribulation, have a rebuilt temple and Antichrist who defiles it, and on and on and on we could go. But God said in the latter days he would gather the Jewish people from the four corners of the earth. And so today in Israel, there are Jewish people from over 100 nations that are present. When would that happen? Ezekiel said the gathering would take place at the end of time. First they are regathered physically, and then the Spirit of God is put in them. And Jeremiah says that will happen during the Great Tribulation period. So a failure for a pastor to preach to his flock the truth of the revelation is not only a failure to do what God has commanded us to do, it's just sheer disobedience and it is very foolish. Why? Because there's a blessing that is associated with the study of this book. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it. This book is understandable, so much so that you can heed it, you can obey it. Write in the book he'll write in Revelation 111. Write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches. And so the believer who fails to learn the truths found in the Revelation, they are forfeiting a blessing that God promises. And listen, any healthy church, any faithful church, any biblical church is a second coming church. They are preaching prophecy. And so when Paul writes to one of the healthiest churches in all the New Testament, the church at Thessalonica, he describes how you turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. They were a healthy, growing, caring church because they were an expectant church. They were waiting for the return of Jesus from heaven. In Revelation 22 and verse 10, among other things, it is a command to expound what God has said. You should be teaching your children at home that Jesus is coming back. You need to tell them that someday they will give an account to him. You need to teach it in your Awana classes, in your upward sports classes, in your Sunday school classes, in your ABFs. Now you say, when are you going to get to the outline? I'm getting there. <laughs> when Jesus comes, he is going to settle who we will be, and who we will be will unfold in two groups. The first group is the lost will be forever unrighteous. The lost will be forever unrighteous. Notice verse 11, let the one who does wrong still do wrong. 
and the one who is filthy still be filthy. Now, John is making a clear connection between what he just said in verse 10 and what he says in verse 11. The time is near, or the King James renders it, the time is at hand, the new King James. He's saying there's a cause-effect relationship between Jesus suddenly showing up and what is going to happen to the people who are here when he comes. It's a warning about those who will put off receiving the Lamb of God. And since the time is very short, since it will come taxes quickly, we got our word tachometer from it, suddenly, which is dealing not so much with the time of time as the kind of time that once it happens, it will be too late. You say, well, does this verse, when he says, let the one who does wrong still do wrong, let the one who is filthy still be filthy, does it suggest that God doesn't want people to repent and to change their ways? No, that would go against the whole tenor of what we've studied already in the Revelation, not to mention the rest of Scripture. No, the angel's statement here in verse 11 needs to be understood in light of the previous statement, behold, I come quickly, and the statement for the time is near. Jesus' coming will occur so quickly that people will not have a chance to change the state which they are in. It's a solemn warning that your decision will determine your character, and your character in the end will show where you will spend an eternity. Look, men are born in sin. We are shaped by sin. Unless we are born again, we will never enter the kingdom of God. Unless we are born from above, unless we have a second birth, we're not ready to meet the living God. And apart from faith in Christ... You will just continue in your wrong. You will just continue in your filthiness. And so when Jesus comes, the lost will continue in their lost, rotten character. And so the point of verse 11 is that when he comes, or if you die before he comes, your character is forever shaped. The rich man who dies and goes to hell, not because he's rich, but because he's an unbeliever, can never, ever change his state. And as Paul brought out in 2 Thessalonians 2, even when the church is caught up and raptured, those who are left behind for that seven-plus-year period who have heard the gospel prior to that time, they won't be able to change their state. They will be locked forever in their unrighteousness. There is no cure for his wrong at that point. And so the lost will go on sinning in the end. They will go on suffering for millions and millions of years. But there's a second group, and that is the saved will be forever righteous. The lost will be forever unrighteous, but the saved will be forever righteous. Let me read the second half of verse 11. And let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. Those who have been declared righteous by faith in the Lord Jesus We call that justification, where God doesn't make you righteous. He declares you righteous. He imputes righteousness to your account. God, who has determined that you are holy, and that's why every Christian in the New Testament is called a saint. You're looking at St. Carl this morning. Now, they wouldn't have called me that in the church I was raised in. You had to die before you could get that title. And the title was based on works, what you've done, and at least a miracle or two that went with it. But in the New Testament, every believer, even the newest believer, is called a saint. God has declared you holy forever. And so once he's declared you holy, you are to practice that holiness. And so the results of expounding the word of God, the words found in the Revelation, will lock some people forever in unbelief, but it will move other people forever in holiness. It's a sobering thought. You reject God's warnings, and you can potentially even today fix your eternal state. You know what one of the saddest verses is for me in all the Bible? It concerns the northern kingdom. It's found in Hosea chapter 4. And God said, Ephraim is joined to idols. Let them alone. Don't do anything. Hosea, don't waste your breath. He's given himself to idols. Leave him alone. Why? Because my spirit will not always strive with men, 
Jesus said about the leaders in, of Israel in his day, let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. There's an urgency for people to respond because you may not have the opportunity to respond tomorrow. Jesus said it this way in Luke chapter 12 when he told us to make a decision when he admonished, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able to. Because of a lack of response, the door can be forever closed. He goes on to say in the next verse, once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door saying, Lord, open up to us. Then he will answer and say to you, I do not know where you are from. Do you remember the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25? It speaks of those who because of their lack of response were not ready when the bridegroom comes. And while they were going to make the purchase, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in to him to the wedding feast and the door was shut. God wants you to know that when the Bible is preached, especially the book of the Revelation, these words, it's either an instrument of salvation or damnation. And so in John 12, because the leaders had habitually time and time and time and time again said no to Jesus, God gave them their wish. And so the text says they could not believe. Why? Because they would not believe. The great Princeton theologian Joseph Alexander in the 19th century wrote these words. There is a time I know not when. There is a place I know not where which marks the destiny of men to heaven or despair. There is a line by us not seen which crosses every path, the hidden boundary between God's mercy and God's wrath. How far may we go on in sin? How long will God forbear? Where does hope end and where begin the confines of despair and answer from the skies is sent? While it is called today, repent. My friend, there is a line you can cross where you will put the final callus on your heart and you will not be able to repent. You will go on in your filthiness and in the end you will go on in your suffering. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong. That's what he's talking about. And the one who is filthy still be filthy. People who want to keep their sin will eventually get their wish because you don't come when you want to come. You come when God knocks on your heart's door. You can't come to Christ on your own. The Spirit must convict you of sin and righteousness and judgment. And every week, because God is pulling on people, he brings people here sometimes for the first time because he wants to save them. But you are free to say no. And someone whose destiny is fixed, they've crossed that line. You know what they do? They mock and make fun of preachers like me. Peter said of them, Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? You born again folks, you're always saying Jesus is coming back. Come on, you can't be serious. You're just another lunatic pastor, brogy. The sad truth is that they are headed for an eternal condemnation. Paul said it this way when the gospel is preached in 2 Corinthians 2, for we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, those who are being saved, an aroma from death to death. To the other, an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? So on the one, to those who are lost, we're an aroma of death. To those who are responsive, we are an aroma of life. Let me put it in modern nomenclature. Are you kidding, Pastor Carl? What you are preaching to me today stinks. I'm never coming back here. I'll never turn on this broadcast again. I don't like what you stand for. And then there will be other people 
what you just shared with me is the most refreshing message I have ever heard in my life. How I can be forgiven of my sin and have life eternal. Paul said, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Look, I've had doors slammed in my face. I've been spit on. I've had people write me nasty notes. On occasion, they leave a message on the church voicemail, and Claudia will say, I don't think you want to hear this, Juan. And then people have, on more than one occasion, told me where to go, and it's never been to heaven. But then I've had wonderful times of people whose countenance has changed, who are filled with joy, sometimes tears flowing down their face face because of the good news. That's the first point. The first response is Christ's return settles who we will be, either eternally lost or saved. But notice in verse 12, the second response, Christ's return settles what we will receive. His return settles what we will receive. And so in verse 12, notice he first says, behold, I am coming quickly. This is the fifth time in the Revelation he said, I am coming quickly. It means soon or shortly. Again, it is dealing not so much with the time of time, but the kind of time that once the events start, they will happen very, very quick. And we've seen that with the seal, bowl, and trumpet judgments. Every generation, though, is to be expectant. They are to be watching. They are to be ready, which is why Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 10 that we are to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. Jesus would say here, I'm coming quickly. In other words, be ready. It could happen at any moment. Could happen before this sermon is over. You need to be ready because when I come, I will come suddenly, quickly, unannounced. Let's read all of verse 12. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. Now, as the context brings out, he is dealing with rewards to two kinds of people. Those who go on in their filth, to those who go on in their holiness. So first, the lost will receive their just reward. The lost people of this world will receive their just reward. Again, according to the context, it's a mixed blessing because he'll reward every man according to his works as we already studied in chapter 20. My reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. Those who know Jesus, it will be blessing. To those who don't, it will spell their eternal Doom. Now, we've seen this phrase, and it's a phrase that's repeated throughout the Scripture that God rewards us according to what we have done. So let's be clear on what that means and what it doesn't mean. Let me refresh your memory. Go back just a page or two in your Bible to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Twice over, in the 20th chapter, he uses the same phrase that people are judged according to their deeds. Now, in chapter 20, of course, if you remember, in verses 11 to 15, he's dealing with the lost of all time. And we read here in verse 12, and I saw the dead, the great and the small, the big shots and the little shots, the well-knowns and the unknowns, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And the dead were judged according to the things which were written in the books. How? According to their deeds. Look again in verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death in Hades gave up the dead which were in them. Death here is a synonym for the grave. Death, the grave has the body, so to speak, but Hades has the soul. And they were judged how? Every one of them according to their deeds. Now, what does that mean? Simply means that God is keeping a record of everything. Everything that you do, every thought that you've had, everything that you've said, God writes it down in indelible ink. In the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon said, for God will bring every deed into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Paul said this in Romans 2, God will judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ. That means things that nobody else knew. God wrote it down. 
Something you thought, I got away with it. No one found out. God wrote it down. Do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12? But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for in the day of judgment. Words of profanity, words of dishonesty, words of exaggeration, words of gossip, every word. There is nothing covered that will not be revealed. Why? Because God has it written in his books. It's plural, biblia. And so that's translated into English as Bible. We speak of the Biblia, our Bible. But God has another set of books in which the works of every unbeliever is recorded. God is omniscient. He's omnipresent. He misses absolutely nothing. And so he will judge every lost person according to their deeds. Here in verse 13 of Revelation 13, I have circled the word everyone. Now, it's a little wooden, but literally the Greek means each one. In other words, he is underscoring while there is this mass of humanity at the great white throne judgment, each and every one gives an account. Jesus prophesied this in Matthew 16. The Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father, and then will repay every man how? According to his deeds. Do we get this? Why does God judge according to deeds? Two reasons. Number one, your deeds will show that you've never been born again. Paul says in Titus 1, they profess to know God, but by their deeds, they deny him. You say, well, I know lost people who do a lot of good deeds. Sure they do. For the glory of men, for the praise of self, for the appeasement of a guilty conscience, but not out of gratitude for having been purchased with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, not out of a grateful heart. And some are doing deeds trying to earn the approval of God. And God says of such people in Isaiah that your righteous deeds are as filthy rags. So God knows that our deeds really ultimately reveal whether or not we've been made a new creature in Christ Jesus. But there's a second reason why God judges every lost man according to his deeds. is because hell is not the same for every lost person. Now, when the Lord Jesus spoke about hell, he described it as an awful place for anyone who went. When he spoke in general terms, it's an awful place. But in other places, he reminded us that there are degrees of punishment in hell. In Matthew 10, Jesus said this to the 12 as he sends them out. Whoever does not receive you nor heed your words as you go out of that house or that city, shake the dust off your feet. Truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Jesus warning hypocrites. He said that they are, they are people who like to walk around in long robes and like respectful greetings in the marketplaces, in chief seats in the synagogues, in places of honor at banquets, who devour widows' houses and for appearance sake offer long prayers, these will receive greater condemnation. Just as heaven is a wonderful place for every believer who goes there, it won't be the same for every believer. And just as hell is an awful place, it's a miserable place, it will be somehow in the perfect justice of God, more miserable for some people than for others. So just know that neither Revelation 22, verse 12, or other passages that speak that you're judged according to your deeds, that it is teaching that you are saved by good works that God somehow has this big scale and he measures the good versus the bad. We'll come to it next week. It is so clear in the context in verse 14. Your lifestyle is determined by your relationship to the lamb. But God will show that there's no way of escape. Paul says every mouth will be shut. No excuses at the judgment seat of the great white throne because men will know they are guilty. So the lost will receive their just reward according to their deeds. But we're also reminded through the rest of Scripture and as this chapter unfolds that the saved will receive their gracious reward again according to their deeds. Behold, I'm coming 
and my reward is with me to render each and every man according to what he has done. Now again, when the Lord Jesus says, I'm coming quickly, it's not simply describing the speed in which he leaves heaven and arrives on the earth, but the suddenness, imminence, soonness of his coming. He's coming quickly, and that's why he said to born-again believers in New Testament terminology in Mark 13, 33, take heed, keep on the alert, for you do not know when the appointed time will come. That's the fourth time he actually said that to his disciples, to take heed, blepite. Someone might ask, well, in view of the rapture and the tribulation and the second coming, why is remaining watchful so urgent? Because, number one, at this point, when Jesus says this, while they have not yet been taught the rapture, they're going to be taught that doctrine there in the upper room, and then the epistles are going to unfold it. It's a mystery. It was something that was in the Old Testament. It was concealed, but it is now fully revealed. It's there in type. Now we look back and we can see it in full. Guys like Enoch, who suddenly is gone, then judgment comes a short time later through the great flood. The church will be caught up. Then the tribulation will come. And just as Noah entered into a brand new world, we, when Jesus comes back at the second coming, will enter into a brand new world with him. But they at least understand, based on what Daniel had revealed, that they were seven plus years away from Messiah's kingdom. Now understand who Jesus gave the Olivet Discourse to. He is reaching out to a handful of his apostles. Here's a chart to help us remember the order of events. The rapture happens first. We're caught up. And so from the Latin Bible, we get the word rapture translating harpazo, for we shall all be caught up. We meet the Lord in the air. A seven-year period unfolds, divided into two halves, tribulation and great tribulation, where then Jesus comes back to the earth. First, he comes for his church. Seven plus years later, he comes back with his church to the earth, where he will then establish his kingdom for a thousand years. And so this generation of disciples know that they're at least seven years away from the kingdom of the Messiah. And so they need to be vigilant. They need to be anticipating it. And now, especially in light of all that God has revealed, we need to be ready. Why? Because you and I will give an account according to our deeds. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. And the judgment takes place in heaven for saved people only. Paul said, for we, he includes himself, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Some of our works done as saved people are bad. You could translate it useless in the sense that when they are tested with fire, there are nothing to use Paul's analogy but wood, hay, and stubble, and they're immediately consumed. No eternal value. Why? Well, maybe we did them for the praise of men. Maybe we did them in the energy of the flesh. Only that that survives of eternal value is that which is done in the power of the Spirit, which is, what, by the way, why I call this a gracious reward. Because God doesn't put you on some performance basis. He saves you by grace. Then he sanctifies you by grace. He says, you be available, you be yielded, and then my Spirit will work in and through you in an eternity. I'll reward you for it. John said it this way, and by the way, if you've not been to the discovery class, we go through in detail the kinds of things that God rewards his people for. Second John 8, one chapter, verse 8, watch yourselves that you might not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Some believers who do not guard their hearts, who have misdirected priorities, will not receive a full reward. And God wants us to receive a full reward. In Revelation 3 and verse 11, Jesus said this to the church, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have in order that no one may take your crown. Again, Paul speaks of the saved who have works that are burned up. If any man's work which is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is through fire. Now, what does that mean, saved, yet so is through fire? 
The foundation Paul describes is Christ. And we build upon that foundation by the life we live to save people. And someday God will test everything that you have done. And there will be some people who will enter the kingdom of God, saved but sinned, so to speak. They'll get in there with their, you know, uh, smoking, so to speak, with their coattails smoking. Now, I know there's always carnally minded people who say, well, I'm just glad I'm going. I'm just glad I'm going to heaven. I don't care if I have just a little old log cabin in the corner of heaven. I'll be glad that I'm there. If you think that way, it probably means you've never been saved. Now, I can't fully explain it, but I do know that believers in heaven, Jesus said it, Paul taught it, will suffer loss. Revelation 22, 11 plainly indicates that apart from faith in the Lord Jesus, as verse 14 will underscore your relationship to the Lamb, you'll never see the inside of the kingdom. But once you are saved, you are to grow in that sanctification process as you allow the Holy Spirit to work in and through your life. Now, if you're here today and you don't know that if you died today or Christ returned that you'd go to heaven, the first step to building a well-ordered life is to receive Jesus. You can't earn heaven. The gift of God is eternal life. You don't earn gifts. When someone gives you a gift, they did the work for it. They paid for it. It's free to the recipient. For the wages of sin is death. That's what you deserve, death. That's what I deserve. But the gift of God is eternal life. You have to humbly admit that you are bankrupt, that you can do nothing, and you receive the gift of eternal life. And if you've never done that, I would encourage you before you leave today, do that. But many of you are members of this church, and maybe some of you take pride in the fact that you just come here every Sunday to hear me preach. But you don't ever tithe. You don't ever pray for the ministries of this church much less participate in them. You can't remember the last time you ever tried to take someone through the plan of salvation. And you'll serve only if it doesn't interfere with your schedule and your lifestyle. And I am telling you, as sure as I am standing on this platform, that you will give an account to Jesus, especially for your relationship to the local church, because that's what God prizes. And if my heart wasn't right, I'd want to get it right today. The eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the whole earth that he might strongly support the persons whose heart is fully his. Jesus said, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me. Paul said, work out your salvation. Not work for, but once you're saved, work it out in dependence with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to work and to will for his good pleasure. Now, Father, I thank you this morning that you've given me the chance to stand here and the people you've entrusted me to shepherd and to tell them the truth. As I've been preaching to them, I've been preaching to myself. And I pray today, Father, for someone who has never received Jesus. They may look back at a time when they walked an aisle and they shook a preacher's hand, maybe when someone even baptized them. But they have no assurance that if this were their last day on earth that they would go to heaven because they've never been saved according to your word. Now we know just as we're born once physically, we're born again just once spiritually. But you said when it happens, we're a new creation, the old has passed away and everything's become new. And if someone here has never found that new life, thank you that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He said, it's not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. Father, help them to call upon Jesus. You said, whoever will call on his name will be saved. Help them in simple, childlike faith to say, Lord Jesus, save me. Now, Father... For those of us who've already crossed that line, help us to take some inventory because the admonition that you've given us is those who are holy are to continue on in that holiness. We are to become more and more like Jesus and to serve him faithfully. 
Lord Jesus, you said it over and over again through your apostles and by your own lips that you will judge each and every one of us as saved people according to our deeds. Thank you that as we are yielded to the Spirit of God, that he equips us, he empowers us, and in eternity, you reward us. How kind and gracious you are. We love you, our Father. May our love exemplify itself in our obedience all the more. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? Now, if you're here today and you've received Jesus, maybe this morning you said for the first time in your life, Lord Jesus, save me. You say, what do I do? You make it public. Maybe you did that in the last few weeks. Make it public. Jesus taught if it's real on the inside, you'll be willing to confess it on the outside. And so as we sing this hymn, if you've never made it public, then come down to this front row and your coming will be saying, I'm not ashamed. Maybe you've not been baptized as we just witnessed this young lady. You do that after you're saved. You put your baptism on the right side of your conversion. Maybe you've done both of those, but you need a church home. We need you. Every born-again believer is to be a member of a New Testament church. There's no floaters in the church, not God's church. So I invite you, if you need to join this church today, to leave your seat and meet me here as well. Matt, lead us.